Je voudrais du soleil vert Des dentelles et des TF Des photos de bord de mer Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je voudrais de la lumière Comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre Je veux changer d'atmosphère Dans mon jardin d'hiver So I wonder, um, it's the DNC's job to best represent the candidates and to hopefully get them elected. They don't have a responsibility to journalism or to journalist outlets. Looking at it from that point of view, given the viewership, does it not make sense to put Democratic candidates in front of a Fox News audience, especially if you're asking them... You know, if you think the audience is going to vote for Trump and you're asking them to vote for Democrats, don't you want to put them in front of that audience? I did, I'd say two things. The first is that in 2016, the Republicans didn't have any debates moderated by MSNBC. And in fact, the only time that they had NBC slated to moderate a debate, they canceled it because Donald Trump refused to go. Now, Do you the, think that was smart? Or do you think that they should have put their candidates in front of everybody they could? I think that you go where the voters of your party are. When, when it's a primary debate, you're going to speak to as many people of your party as you can. What about states like California now, that have open primaries the other now? Thing, the other thing that I'd say, though, is that this, these debates aren't going to be behind a paywall. They're on a different channel. And any Democrat who's watching uh, Fox News right now, I guarantee they know how to change the channel. What do you think? Wasn't it CNN? Wasn't it Donna Brazile through CNN that fed questions to Hillary Clinton? Wasn't wasn't that wasn't that right? I just find this extremely rich that the DNC is all of a sudden caring, so it's funny, caring if you, about if, objectivity. If you read if you read the piece that was just discussed in the New Yorker, it says that essentially the exact same thing was done from Fox News to Donald Trump. Right, and I think that, that was incorrect. And, and I think that, that was wrong. At the same time Hang that on. Donald Trump was railing against all and of this. And I think that that, that was wrong. An allegation that certainly we don't agree with, and I don't know where their sourcing is or, or what their proof is on that front. But keeping it to what we're talking about right now, I don't know if it's in the best interest. Maybe it is in the best interest to keep the Democratic candidates from being pursued by somebody like Chris Wallace, who's a really tough questioner, or Martha McCallum or Brett Baer. I mean, maybe the Democrats feel like they can't stand up to that kind of debate prep and questions. I don't know if it's that they can't stand up to it. I just, I think it's unfortunate because I think, okay, sure, you want to talk to your base. I get that. But on the other hand, I think if you want to move forward and have progress in life, like in all aspects, you want to talk to everybody. I mean, if there's an opportunity that out of, say, a thousand people watching, you could sway one person by what you're saying, then I think that that's worth it for both sides. I think both sides should have the opportunity to talk to everybody. And I think right now, being in between you guys, by the way, <laughs> is a really tough place to be. <laughs> Uh, Kennedy? Well, it's it's interesting because I, I think what Democrats see is in 2016, the moderators of the Fox debates on Fox News uh, were very tough on the Republican candidates. Right. And I think this is a cowardly move because they, they saw how these moderators really held those candidates' feet to the fire. It was not an echo chamber, and it was not necessarily a friendly forum, and no, I think that's what they're scared of. And I think Democrats, if they really want to win the general election, they need to get outside of the echo chamber. Yeah. You need to really extend yourself outside of the bubble and submit yourself to this level of scrutiny. It, it was interesting, um, you know, in a recent article where they were talking about the industrial Midwest and that this is sort of the area that Trump, by surprise, took over in the last election that was typically a Democratic stronghold. And if that's the case, it seems like you would want to, if there were viewers that were traditionally Democrats that went to President Trump, that you want to win back. That's all the more case why you want to get in front of Trump people and show them maybe you went over for one election, but here's 
you know, 26 reasons or whatever it is why you should come back to the Democrats I, now. I guarantee you the Democrats, the 20 or so candidates who are running, are going to be talking to people all across the country. They're going to be talking to folks in Iowa. They're doing it right now. They're going to be talking to folks in Ohio, in Michigan. So why would they be afraid? Why would they it's be afraid? It's not a question of being afraid. afraid. But it's a debate a setting is very different, and you know that. That's different than going out to a, a, a rally or to a pancake breakfast in Iowa when, when you're standing up there with the other people who are running for president. And not only are they challenging each other, the moderators are challenging those beliefs. And and right now, they are essentially being unchallenged about Medicare for all and some I of the ultra-left... I guarantee you that... All of the that all of the moderators are going to ask questions about all of these issues because this is how you find out what the candidates believe. Now, I don't think it's unreasonable to say we're going to go, you know, where the primary voters are and make sure that they can see our message, and also to say again, who based has, on who has more viewers, Fox News or MSNBC, and who has more Democrats. <laughs> it is Friday, the eighth of March of twenty nineteen, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam, and our daily special is Blue Moon Spirits Fridays. We have made it to the end of the week, folks, because (laughs) it's going to get really busy this weekend. Mueller Indictment Friday. Something big is coming up again, as if what happened during the week wasn't big enough. Wow. Hey, on this International Women's Day, I'd like to uh, extend... Very, very, very happy birthday wishes to my sister. Happy birthday, sis. Uh, God, I love you. And uh, we'll be seeing you later on. All right. Yeah, my sister has her birthday today. And we share the same age for just about three weeks. Because I'll have my birthday here at the end of the month. And then I'll be a year older than her again. Wow. Okay. Uh My real dad was a Catholic. You figure it out. All righty. Hey, Paul Manafort got off pretty good. I think that if you were able to launder, I don't know, what was it? 60 million? Maybe something less than that. But uh, tens of millions of dollars worth of rubles. And you, for for the Russians, obviously, rubles. and, and, And you're able to launder that much money and only get four years? You're doing pretty good. You're doing pretty good. Uh, In fact, Trump was out this morning pretty much tweeting that that was a win. Yeah, there's obviously no collusion, and we have a story about that coming up here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Yeah, his lawyer made some sort of mention, and we'll get into that in a little bit more depth later on. But uh, yeah, Trump Trump's out there saying no collusion. Uh, my uh, former campaign manager was only convicted of uh, fraud and bank fraud, and you know, so you know, yeah, I had a crook, I had a crook, but I hardly knew him. I this guy. <laughs> Everybody knows he's a mobster. The only problem is, is that a lot of the MAGA hats wanted a mobster to be president because they thought, well, maybe that'll stick it to the libs. Law and order. (laughs) We'll show you. All right. Yeah, it was a ruse the whole time. And that's another one of those trademarked I told you so's. Because way back in the day when they had pretty much a lock on the term law and order, they were the law and order party. I pretty much uh, said, no, no, they are not law and order, but they'll use it to uh, get what they want. And they got what they want. And now we have a mobster for president. Isn't that nice? Well, uh, at the top there, that was uh, uh, Fox, the, 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 the team at Fox. They were sitting on the sofa, you know, the leggy women on International Women's Day. I'm talking about leggy women. Well, it's Fox. They promote that stuff. Jeez. But nonetheless, uh, pontificating on what the Democrats should do in the Democratic primary. And they are just upset that the Democrats are pretty much excluding Fox News from hosting a debate. Well, too bad. (laughs) I would prefer, I'm, I'm a little old school, but I prefer the League of Women Voters would be hosting the debates, not news networks. The news networks carry the debates. They don't host them. All right. Let's go back to uh, 
when uh, people were really trying to make America great. <laughs> Jeez, boy, they sure ripped that away from us, and they're continuing it. Looks like John Cornyn, uh, just as an aside, John Cornyn is reading again. He's quoting de Tocqueville today. Wow, before he was uh, quoting Mussolini, and he goes, well, what's wrong with Mussolini? And then people had to explain to him, and he go, and he still said, I don't know what the problem is. But okay, I'll, I'll go with what you guys are saying, kids, these days. And so uh, now he's quoting to Tocqueville. I don't really think he understands what he's reading. Uh, but it's kind of fun. So follow that, John Cornyn. Jeez. Hey, what's on the rest of the menu here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy? Oh, uh, hey, Congress is investigating Brian Kemp's voter suppression scheme that secured his win of the Georgia governorship. Yeah, something was going on there, and Stacey Abrams tried to tell everybody. Democratic senators tell Trump it's time to prove his Chinese election hacking claims. Yeah, he keeps talking about the Chinese hacking, and there's no evidence of it. We haven't, well, no. There's not enough to uh, warrant, you know, Trump's claims. Especially when it looks like his friend Vlad's been doing, and is doing it right now. And, as I mentioned earlier, Manafort's lawyer made a bizarre, specific denial about collusion with Russia. He was playing to an audience of one, and we know that that audience of one was Trump. But there's another one he was talking to as well, wasn't he? We'll speculate. Hey, after the break, we'll move to the chef's table where Senator Richard Blumenthal wants a criminal investigation of military base landlords. Private landlords renting out properties on military bases. And, uh, you know, so people get electrocuted in the shower. Ah, mistakes happen. And 23 Republicans were the only House members to vote no on a resolution that condemns anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, and other forms of bigotry. Which just proves, do not F around with Nancy Pelosi. Nancy Pelosi will F around with you. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. that we will be having a busy weekend. I wasn't just uh, alluding to all of Mueller indictment Fridays and all of the news that will be breaking over the weekend because that's what the weekends are for now. They think that we're asleep, that we're doing something else, and so they'll news dump us then like they always did. Eh, I think we're beyond that old school thinking, aren't we? But uh, actually, it's, it's not such a unwanted busyness that I'll be experiencing this weekend. I have my youngest granddaughter coming to visit and uh, my sister's birthday is today. So we'll be having a dinner over at my sister's place and uh, my nephew and his wife, I guess that makes her my niece. Yeah, sure. Uh, we'll be uh, putting the dinner together and uh, it should be a grand time. And I have my granddaughter for the weekend and we're going to be doing stuff. Um, my older granddaughter, I know, is faring a lot better since uh, my son d uh, passed away, died. <laughs> and uh, uh, But my youngest granddaughter, she's been a bit quiet, and uh, I just sort of let her be. But uh, we'll, we'll run around and, you know, do some shopping and things, things like that and 
go to the Arboretum and walk around because she likes to do that too. So, uh, I, it will be fun indeed. And then I should also mention, I will be on Tim Coromall's panel for, uh, we, he does his, uh, recordings on Sundays. So, uh, look for that, uh, next week and, uh, let you know what else is going on in the world, uh, uh, next week, <laughs> of course. Hey, if you would go to the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com, to the right-ish of the page is the chat room link monitored by Kelly Lincoln, and she has a couple of shows on the weekends, uh, the first being At the Table with Kelly Lincoln on Saturdays, and that's at 3 p.m. on the West Coast, 6 p.m. on the East Coast. And then a few hours later, she teams up with Ricky for the late night morning show. And they do that at, well, 9 p.m. on the West Coast and midnight on the East Coast. That's how I'll, that's how it becomes a late night morning show. And, uh, yeah, it's drive time. It is because that's how we live now around the clock. So tune into that. If you would then look to the leftish of our homepage at the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com from the chat room link, you will notice the contribute button and please do become a, a recurring Patreon of Netroots Radio. Your uh, recurring contribution helps us keep the lights on and paying our bills and saving for the purchase of needed equipment so that this powerhouse of resistance radio keeps resisting as the founders originally intended. So thank you for your generosity in helping us do that. If you would want to follow the show on Twitter, you can do that at Netroots radio. Tom takes care of that. I take care of myself at justice Putnam because who else would <laughs> trust me. And uh, I also post the show notes and links diary on Daily Co's about 10 minutes before showtime. I get the links on so social media within that 10 minute period. Hopefully uh, it gets pretty busy then right to the last 10 minutes. It gets darn busy. But uh, look for that. And also pod. Oh, you can follow the show on Twitter at Cookbook West. And then podcasts can be found on Stitcher, Spreaker, uh, iTunes, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, and wherever fine podcasts can be found. This uh, first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Blue Moon Spirits Fridays, they've been mixed up. Help yourself. Okay. It's all there for you. I would suggest if you're if you're having a French 77 in honor of Blue Moon Spirits Fridays, wherever you are out in the real world, don't do more than two. And if you do two, if you do two of them, uh, take care. All right. Three, you're going to need care for someone else. All right. Dan Desai Martin at Share Blue Media does bring us this first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Brian Kemp's years of suppressing the black vote in Georgia might have helped him win his race for governor. And Dan, Dan is doing the journalistic integrity thing. I appreciate it. But it doesn't uh, really uh, appear that it helped him. It, it's not that it might have helped him. It did. After years of actively working to suppress those voting rights, Congress is now taking a closer look at the shady tactics Kemp employed while he was Secretary of State and whether those tactics might have impacted the results of the election. Well, we watched it in real time. The House Oversight Committee is investigating recent reports of serious problems with voter registration, voter access, and other matters affecting the ability of people in Georgia to exercise their right to vote. Representative Elijah Cummings, Democrat of Maryland, and chair of the committee wrote in a Wednesday letter to Kemp. Cummings added that the committee is concerned about reports that Georgians faced unprecedented challenges with registering to vote and significant barriers to casting their votes 
during the 2018 election. The letter was also signed by Representative Jamie Raskin. Boy, he's a fireball, isn't he? He's also a Democrat from Maryland and chair of the Subcommittee on Civil Rights and Civil Liberties. As the letter notes, as Secretary of State, Kemp helped purge 1.4 million people from the Georgia voting rolls, and you know they were black. Let's be clear. Or their fellow travelers. And then he closed 200 polling locations across the state. And in 2018, when he was running for governor, he placed the voter registration applications of 53,000 people, mostly people of color, on hold. And he put it in his desk, his secretary of state secretary desk, and held them there. But he's Secretary of State. Just happens to be running for governor, too. During that 2018 election, voters in predominantly black counties waited hours and hours to cast their vote, even though there were unused voting machines sitting in warehouses. After years of those efforts to suppress the black vote, Kemp narrowly defeated Stacey Abrams, who would have been Georgia's first black woman governor. When she was asked during the campaign if she believed Kemp was intentionally suppressing certain voters by putting those 53,000 registrations on hold, Abrams replied, absolutely. Well, Congress is looking for documents related to voter purges, polling location closures, and the availability and use of voting machines in the state in order to get a better picture of how Kemp and the Republican-led state of Georgia may have driven down voter turnout. Casey Michelle of Think Progress brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Blue Moon Spirits Fridays. Well, Democratic senators are now demanding answers from the intelligence community on Trump's Chinese interference claims. In a letter sent Wednesday, Senators Ron Wyden, my senator here in Oregon, a Democrat, of course, Martin Heinrich, a Democrat of New Mexico, and Kamala Harris, Democrat of California, wrote to the Director of National Intelligence, Dan Coats, to request that information on purported Chinese election interference and those efforts be made public. There may be no intelligence issue in which the public interest is stronger than foreign influence with regard to U.S. elections, the senators wrote. It is critically important that the American people understand which specific activities each of our adversaries have or have not undertaken and to what degree. Well, you know that the White House is going to say this is executive privilege. They can't let us know what stories they're making up to wag the dog with us or to suppress, I don't know, the uh, takeover of our country by a hostile foreign power that usually writes in Cyrillic. Now, specifically, the senators asked Coates to declassify an October 31st, 2018 letter, which detailed China's election interference efforts, or lack thereof. That letter, according to the senators, includes important information about the 2018 elections as well as the 2016 elections. Really, now? The senators have been requesting information to back up Trump's claims for months. Trump claimed in September that China was trying to interfere in the 2018 midterm elections, and Trump even stood in front of the U.N. to say he had evidence of his claim but failed to produce any. I mean, he could have at least brought some pictures of aluminum tubes and said, this is proof that they're trying to hack us, and look, these are the tubes that they're using. Intertubes. You gotta go way back to get that one. 
Coates' October 31 letter remains classified, and a February 8th follow-up letter from Coates to Wyden detailed only what Coates and his colleagues had written or said previously in prior testimonies on the topic. In that letter, Coates reasserted his testimony that China was one of the countries that attempted to influence the 2018 U.S. elections. They had a 400-pound guy sitting, I don't know, pretty close to Tibet. But all these prior assessments have centered on Chinese efforts to influence public sentiment and government policies and undermine confidence in democratic institutions, Coates wrote. Not outright election interference as seen with Russia in 2016. That unclassified letter did not address whether China interfered in 2016, as Trump claimed, a statement from Wyden's office noted. Despite China's other efforts, little Evidence has emerged to back up Trump's claims that China directly interfered in the U.S. 2018 midterms or that they carried out an operation comparable to the Russian election interference campaign in 2016. There remains a clear distinction between Chinese attempts to influence Western audiences and Russia's. The Kremlin hacked Democratic Party institutions, set up fake pro-Trump social media accounts, and helped push the Republican nominee toward the presidency. And it looks like they also had specific voter data in which to, you know, make sure you got 70 extra votes for an electoral college win spread over three states. Matthew Chapman over at Alternate brings us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. On Thursday evening, uh, Judge T.S. Ellis decided to completely ignore federal sentencing guidelines to give Donald Trump's former campaign chairman, Paul Manafort, who was convicted of bank fraud and tax evasion in his work for international oligarchs, a 47-month sentence. Shortly after... Manafort's attorney, Kevin Downing, reiterated to reporters a denial of collusion with Russia, but in doing so, qualified his statement in a bizarre way that was hard to miss. There is absolutely no evidence that Paul Manafort was involved in any collusion with any government official from Russia, attorney Kevin Downing noted. So let's look at that. Russia does not just rely on government officials to conduct espionage and other overseas operations. As Russian social media operations demonstrate, they often rely on unwitting assets rather than actual spies and government officials to direct intelligence offensives. So that denial leaves Manafort a lot of room to have colluded with Russia To name just one example, Manafort is known to have had a relationship and even shared 2016 campaign data with Konstantin Kilmanik, a Ukrainian operative who served as a translator in the Soviet military and may have ongoing ties to Russian intelligence. Manafort may even have held secret talks with WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange, And while there is no evidence Assange is working directly for Vladimir Putin, there is substantial evidence that he's at least an idiot and a dupe, in this reporter's opinion. It is entirely possible that Downing is telling the truth that Manafort never colluded with any government official in Russia, 
But it is hard to argue he had no links of any sort to Russia or that the activity he conducted didn't put him in close contact with, uh, with the Kremlin's influence. Downing's denial could be true in the most literal sense, but in practical terms, much less so. Let's get to our break, and when we come back from that break, we're going to go through weather from around the world, and then we're going to finish up with the stories that we have curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, and we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new Earth. This is Take to Movie Review. I'm Clinton Johnston. This week, the familiar, a little spoilage, and only a little bit of the rock, but it all works out in the end. Ready? So which is more important, plot or character? Having asked, let's look at Fighting With My Family, the latest film by co-creator of The Office, writer-director Stephen Merchant. Fighting With My Family is a biopic about professional wrestler Paige, depicting how she went from being Sarara Knight, wrestling with her family in Norwich, England, to the WWE auditions, to their boot camp in Miami, and finally to a shot at the WWE Diva title. Considering that this movie is mostly the Knights of Norwich, it's interesting to note that this very English film is a very American movie. In fact, it's two American movies, and you've seen them both before. First, it's the underdog against the odds sports movie. You know it, underdog is scrappy, doing things in their quirky underdog way. But surprise, underdog makes it into the championship, competing against the popular show dogs on the way to the big game. Underdog struggles with their shaky skills and self-doubt until they lose faith in themselves. And right as the underdog is about to give up, coach gives the talk, saying underdog can't be anybody but themselves, And that's all they need. Inspired, the underdog makes it through the championships, plays the big game, and usually wins. All of that. Fighting with my family is all of that. It is also a family's more important than anything else movie, because coach here is Sarah is essential to her psyche older brother, Zach, who pulls away from her because she made the WWE and he didn't. You know what? It's also a coming of age, coming into yourself story. Oh, it's also the plucky immigrant story. So it's four movies you've seen. But here's the thing. Even though I noticed the formulas and could see what was coming, at the end, I was still on the edge of my seat. Because you know what makes a plot formula work? Character. Pew's Knight in Fighting With My Family wins you over. She's tough enough for you to think she might win, but vulnerable enough that you fear that she'll lose. And you like her. You want her to win the match and win back her family. And it makes the film. Plus, you get a little bit of The Rock. Told you. This has been Take Two Movie Review. I'm Clinton Johnston. Catch up with us at TakeTwoMovieReview.com and feed us back on our page on YouTube. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Christopher Intagliata. It sounds like a witch's recipe. Gather the hearts of a fence lizard, a little brown bat, a naked-tailed armadillo, and dozens of others. So initially we tried to get them from zoo, but unfortunately that didn't work out very well. (laughs) We couldn't get any samples. Even when the animal died, we couldn't get a heart. Guo Huang a developmental biologist at the University of California, San Francisco. He says they had more success obtaining specimens from the jars of natural history museums. But the reason for this biological scavenger hunt? Huang and his colleagues wanted to examine the number of chromosomes contained in heart cells across the animal kingdom. Because there's a curious phenomenon in our hearts, which is that most of the human body's cells are diploid, meaning two sets of chromosomes, one from each parent, but the lion's share of our heart cells are actually polyploid, meaning two or more copies from mom, two or more copies from dad. What Wang and his team found, looking at that collection of hearts, is that the proportion of polyploid cells in a heart goes up as you go from fish to lizards to amphibians to transitional species like platypuses to mammals. The reason that finding might matter to us is that recent studies in mice and zebrafish have shown that hearts with more diploid cells, like a zebrafish's, are actually able to regenerate and heal themselves. Hearts with more polyploid cells, like mice and humans, cannot. So what makes a heart have more polyploid cells and thus less chance of regenerating? That's actually a million-dollar question. But one answer Huang's team found is that thyroid hormone, the same hormone that regulates metabolism and makes us warm-blooded creatures, might be to blame. Because when they added extra thyroid hormone to zebrafish's tanks, their tiny hearts were no longer able to regenerate. 
And conversely, when they engineered mice to have hearts that were insensitive to thyroid hormone, the mouse hearts could regenerate back after injury. When we look at the heart function, which is mainly measured by contractility of the heart, we can see the heart function improve over time after injury, while control mice cannot improve. The results are in the journal Science. As for fixing human hearts, perhaps manipulating thyroid hormone levels could be a start. We know regulating thyroid hormone probably alone is not sufficient to cure heart disease, at least for promote heart regen completely. And if we can figure out other major regulator of this process, we might be in a better shape. Thanks for listening. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. Hi, I'm Tom Harbin, and since you're listening to NetrootsRadio.com, show your progressive side and go to the Donate button on the bottom of the homepage. It's progressives like you who power Netroots Radio and keep the progressive message beaming everywhere 24 hours a day. Just go to our Donate button at the bottom of NetrootsRadio.com. Thank you for keeping progressive radio at full power. In prisons and jails, who ends up in solitary confinement? I'm Bill Newman, and this is the Civil Liberties Minute. At a recent public hearing before the Massachusetts legislature about solitary confinement, a former inmate explained, quote, If you have a disagreement with a correctional officer and they don't like you, you're going to the hole. They tell you to do something and you don't do it fast enough. You're going to the hole. They come to do the count and you don't stand up quick enough. Later that night, they come to your cell, and you're going to the hole. The hole is solitary confinement. It's an apt description. Last year, the Massachusetts legislature passed a law to restrict and reduce the use of solitary confinement in Massachusetts prisons and jails. But as that recent hearing demonstrates, the Department of Correction has found ways to skirt the law, including locking up a person in a cage for 21 or 22 instead of 23 hours a day, and calling that confinement something else. As Jesse White, an attorney with Prisoners Legal Services of Massachusetts, said, quote, the Department of Corrections intends to bring itself into technical compliance with the letter of the law while subverting the intention of the law and continuing to rely on solitary confinement as a linchpin of management practices. The Civil Liberties Minute is made possible by the ACLU because freedom can't protect itself. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. You may know that March is Women's History Month, but did you know why it takes place each year in the month of March? It all goes back to today in labor history. The year was 1857. That was the day that hundreds of women working in New York City's garment industry went on strike. The women demanded better wages, safer working conditions, a 10-hour workday, and equal rights. In the years that followed the historic strike, March 8th became an important time for women workers to rally in the city. So on March 8th, 1908, a crowd of 15,000 women workers in New York took to the streets. The marching women demanded the right to vote, an end to sweatshops, and a halt to child labor. At the International Socialist Congress in 1910, a German woman named Clara Zetkin proposed March 8th be declared as International Women's Day. Women from 17 countries agreed, and over the years, the day continued to hold a special place for women in the labor movement. Women from Bangladesh to South Africa to Venezuela have held demonstrations for workers and civil rights on this day. By 1980, President Jimmy Carter declared the week surrounding March 8th Women's History Week. His declaration read in part, Too often, the women were unsung, and sometimes their contributions went unnoticed. But the achievements, leadership, courage, strength, and love of the women who built America was as vital as of the men whose names we know so well. In 1987, the week was expanded, and March became known as Women's History Month. And it all started with garment workers who were not afraid to stand up for their rights. 
leading the way for countless numbers of other women who have bravely followed in their footsteps. Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and The Rick Smith Show. For more information, go to laborhistoryin2.com, like us on Facebook, and follow us on the Twitters at Labor History in Two. It's time for Nicole Sandler's What's News from NicoleSandler.com and the Progressive Voices Network. Donald Trump's former campaign chair, Paul Manafort, was sentenced to less than four years in prison by a federal judge on tax and bank fraud charges brought by special counsel Robert Mueller. A 47-month sentence in this case where Mueller's prosecutors had asked for 19 to 24 years Federal Judge T.S. Ellis spoke before sentencing. He talked about that recommended prison term guideline. Quote, these guidelines are quite high. I think this sentencing range is excessive. Manafort has been a good friend to others, a generous person. He has lived an otherwise blameless life. Huh? Manafort also had a chance to speak, saying, quote, The last two years have been the most difficult years for my family and I. To say that I feel humiliated and ashamed would be a gross understatement. I ask for your compassion. I know it is my conduct that has brought me here. And that was as close as Manafort got to an apology. Then came the surprising 47-month sentence. After the sentence was announced, Manafort's attorney made a brief statement. Mr. Manafort finally got to speak for himself. He made clear he accepts responsibility for his conduct. And I think most importantly, what you saw today is the same thing that we had said from day one. There is absolutely no evidence that Paul Manafort was involved with any collusion with any government official from Russia. No collusion? Seriously? By a vote of 407 to 23, the House on Thursday passed a resolution condemning anti-Semitism and other forms of hatred, this following days of debate over comments by Representative Ilan Omar that some lawmakers said were anti-Semitic. Amid a sharp split among Democrats, an initial plan for a resolution that focused on anti-Semitism was broadened to include language against Islamophobia and hatred of many minority groups. The 23 who voted no are all no surprise, Republicans. The list of bigots includes Louis Gohmert, Paul Gosar, Peter King, and the number three in Republican House leadership, Liz Cheney. Noted racist and white supremacist Congressman Steve King of Iowa voted present. The House on Friday will vote on H.R. 1, the Democrats' For the People Act, that would enact wide-ranging ethics reform, expand voting rights, and mandate the disclosure of presidential tax returns. As you'd expect, the Republican Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell has said he won't bring it up for a vote. The White House also issued a veto threat on the measure. Congress is investigating a report that says the United States government created a secret database of activists, journalists, and social media influencers tied to the migrant caravan, and in some cases, placed alerts on their passports. The Department of Homeland Security and the House Homeland Security Committee disclosed the probe following a report that CBP officials in San Diego made a list of 59 reporters, lawyers, and activists who were to be targeted for questioning when crossing the U.S.-Mexico border. The committee has demanded a copy of the list, as well as any dossiers on the individuals, and an explanation of why each person was included on the list. Remember that citizenship question the Trump administration wants to put on the 2020 census? A second judge has now ruled against it and raised red flags about the Secretary of Commerce, Wilbur Ross. MSNBC's Chris Hayes explains. For the second time this year, a federal judge has taken the extraordinary step in ruling that Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross acted in bad faith and broke several laws when he asked a citizenship question to the 2020 census. Last year, Ross said that there was no evidence that the response rate would drop once the citizenship question was added. He told Congress it was the Justice Department that, quote, initiated the request, which would lead to doing a better job of enforcing the Voting Rights Act of 1965. It was because we know how obsessed the Sessions DOJ was with that. Well, it turns out none of that was really true. Court documents revealed that Ross actually came up with a citizenship question after Steve Bannon asked Ross if he would be willing to speak with Kansas Secretary of State Chris Kobach about a possible citizenship question. 
The lies that Ross has told are so egregious that last month, when a federal judge ruled against the decision to add that question to the 2020 census, he wrote that Ross's explanations for his decision were unsupported by or even counter to the evidence before the agency and that it was not in accordance with law. Then yesterday, a second federal court found Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross acted in bad faith, broke several laws, and violated the constitutional underpinning of representative democracy. According to the judge, in short, the inclusion of the citizenship question of the 2020 census threatens the very foundation of our democratic system and does so based on a self-defeating rationale. And finally, Friday is International Women's Day and March is Women's History Month. It figures that the Trump administration marks the occasion by rescinding the International Women of Courage Award it had offered to Finnish investigative journalist Jessica Arrow after reportedly unearthing some old anti-Trump tweets. Foreign Policy reported Thursday that Arrow was originally chosen for the reward because of her investigative work exposing Russian troll factories and had regularly tweeted criticism about Trump's sharp political rhetoric and attacks on the press. I got good news. And that's a bit of what's news for now. I'm Nicole Sandler. If you appreciate these reports and the Nicole Sandler Show, I hope you'll consider making a contribution. My work is 100% listener supported and I can't do it without your help. Find out more at NicoleSandler.com slash donate. From UN headquarters in New York, I'm Luke Fargus with your World in Two Minutes. Saudi Arabia earned its most vocal condemnation to date in the halls of the UN Human Rights Council on Thursday, as 36 countries condemned the kingdom's murder of journalist Jamal Khashoggi and ongoing restrictions on free speech and the rights of women. It's long overdue. Lou Charbonneau is the UN Director for Human Rights Watch and said Thursday's joint statement was the first time ever that Saudi Arabia faced public criticism at the Geneva-based council. We're glad that states are putting their views on the record. A number of U.S. allies joined the criticism of Saudi Arabia, but the U.S. was nowhere to be found. President Trump withdrew the U.S. from the Human Rights Council last year, a move that allowed another vocal country to take America's place. Iceland replaced the United States after it left the Human Rights Council in a short-sighted show of solidarity with Israel. It's ironic that it was Iceland that actually led this effort. Whether Thursday's statement does anything to change, Saudi Arabia's behavior remains to be seen. A growing number of countries want Saudi Arabia to cooperate with an investigation into the Khashoggi murder being led by UN expert Agnes Kalamar. Last month, Kalamar faulted Saudi Arabia for blocking Turkish law enforcement from properly investigating Khashoggi's death, and she blamed the kingdom for hiding behind diplomatic protections to facilitate the commission of a crime. Bipartisan members of the U.S. Senate echoed those concerns on Capitol Hill this week, but they faced pushback from President Trump's nominee to be the next ambassador to Saudi Arabia, John Abizaid. Abi Zaid defended Saudi Arabia as an essential partner and warned that, quote, any scaling back of that relationship diminishes our ability to secure vital American national security interests in the region and cedes influence to our competitors around the world. Luke Vargas, the United Nations. Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Blue Moon Spirits Fridays. We always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 34 degrees Fahrenheit, and it even feels like 34 degrees Fahrenheit. We're looking to have, well, uh, a high of about 48 to 49 degrees, though over the weekend, we're looking at highs in the mid to upper 50s, overnight lows, though, in the low 30s, but no chance of rain until, well, Tuesday or Wednesday. Right now, winds are light and variable out of the north. And they will increase, it looks like, in about an hour or so. 
and they will have shifted out of the west-southwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. And then tonight, as we have that chilly low 30s uh, weather, they will continue at 5 to 10 miles, but have shifted then out of the south to southeast. Well, that's going to be nice. Uh, We're also looking, as I said, at rain Tuesday or Wednesday, though the nights are not going to be as chilly. uh, Possible still snow showers mixed in with the rain, and we'll look to see how that is. Going to have some nice days until then. Pollen is rated at none. The air quality index is at 27 parts per million. Considered good for some, not so good for those that have breathing issues. The daytime UV index is at four and moderate. Uh, really, time any time is good time to put on some sunscreen, but it's getting even more important now. Barometric pressure is rising at 29.77 inches. Visibility is up to nine miles, and humidity is at 91%. So we still have some humidity in the air. Well, weather from around the world is brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property, and these people positively live around the world. London is 49 degrees with rain. Paris is 54 and mostly cloudy. Rome is 61 and partly cloudy. Kiev is 56 and fair. Kabul is 38 and fair. Hong Kong is 60 degrees with rain. Tokyo is 41 degrees and clear. Sydney, Australia is 73 degrees and partly cloudy. San Francisco, California is 46 and fair. And New York, New York is a chilly, crisp 32 degrees Fahrenheit and fair. If you think that 32-degree freezing crispy air is fair, you're at home. And that is weather from around the world, brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. And these people planted these purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property. And these people positively live around the world. heartening to see how the house is uh, conducting their oversight. And it would be even more heartening if we could wrest control of the Senate from the Republicans who seem to be there only to obstruct and maybe dismantle the last vestiges of what it is to be America, at least in this reporter's opinion. So it is even more heartening to see Richard Blumenthal Uh, stepping up here and trying to get something done on the Senate side in spite of the obstacles that he's going to have thrown his way. Uh, This offering here, or offering, this amuse-bouche here at the chef's table is out of Reuters by anonymous worker bees. Well, Blumenthal called yesterday for a criminal fraud investigation of private landlords who operate housing on U.S. military bases following Reuters' report that showed how thousands of U.S. military families were subjected to serious health and safety hazards in on-base housing. Well, are these the same people that would build the barracks over in Iraq when George W. was doing stuff and our troops were getting electrocuted in the showers? Is that the same group? I wonder. Blumenthal was speaking at a hearing of the Senate Armed Services Committee called to discuss how to hold the military and contractors accountable for substandard living conditions on some bases. The U.S. Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines unveiled a proposed Tenant Bill of Rights on Wednesday, which we reported about here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, that would hand more power to military families facing housing hazards. The proposed bill could usher in a major overhaul of the military's two-decade-old housing privatization program, 
among other steps. It will require the military to renegotiate contracts worth billions of dollars with the real estate companies and bondholders who back the deals. The measure was prompted by a Reuters series called Ambushed at Home that detailed how thousands of U.S. military families have been subjected to hazards including mold, lead poisoning, pest infestations, and other issues that have only limited tenant rights under the military's confidential contracts with private landlords. A draft of the document signed by the secretaries of the Navy, Army, and Air Force proposes several measures. One would allow military-based tenants to withhold rent payments from landlords if housing troubles persist. I would say put it in an escrow account. Please, keep a paper record. Don't just not pay your rent. Put it in an escrow account. Please. Potentially resulting in refunds and then other provisions would guarantee tenants access to housing advocates when they dispute landlords or allow them to move at no cost to suitable lodging if repairs are not made. Once again, do not just withhold rent. Put it in an escrow account. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles Rester toujours fidèle C'est tout C'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps Mes étés de mer Mes automnes, quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers Emily Singer of Share Blue Media brings us this last amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Blue Moon Spirits Fridays Republicans are in disarray After spending days condemning what they called anti-Semitic tropes from a Democratic lawmaker, nearly two dozen GOP lawmakers voted against a House resolution that condemned anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, white supremacy, and bigotry of all kinds. All Democrats voted for the resolution, which specifically condemns recent gun massacres where the shooters were motivated by bigotry one at a black church in Charleston, South Carolina, and one at a synagogue in Pittsburgh. It also singles out the white supremacist march in Charlottesville, Virginia, where a neo-Nazi murdered an innocent anti-racism protester when he motored down in his car. Well, we all know that that resolution was sparked by comments by Ilhan Omar, who criticized the influence of the Israeli lobby on American politics. She was herself criticized for the way she phrased her her remarks, which many said echoed anti-Semitic tropes. But Republicans were especially eager to accuse Omar, a Muslim woman of color, and a Somali refugee of being a raging anti-Semite who deserves to be punished. Their outrage is as hypocritical as it comes. And I should add one more time. Nancy Pelosi manipulated this vote because she knew that the usual suspects wouldn't vote for it. Why? Because there were some very fine people on the Nazi side of the Republican Party. And it's getting hard to figure out where the demarcation is from Nazi and not Nazi. All right, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day and also the week. But you know that Netroots Radio is going to broadcast on. And we'll meet up on Monday for River City Hash Mondays right here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, of course. So you know it's Mueller uh, Indictment Friday. (laughs) What's going to happen tomorrow? I don't know, but uh, Netroots Radio will be there. Uh, We have some live uh, uh, national providers that will bring you all that live news as it happens. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all weekend for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we'll meet up here on Monday, right here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. 
Bon Appetit. Je voudrais du soleil vert Des dentelles et des TF Des photos de bord de mer De mon jardin d'hiver Je voudrais de la lumière Comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre Je veux changer d'atmosphère De mon jardin d'hiver Du frais d'Aster, revoir un latte coel. Je voudrais toujours te plaire dans mon jardin d'hiver. Je veux déjeuner par terre, comme au long de golfe clair. T'embrasser les yeux ouverts dans mon jardin d'hiver. Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver 